we might as well start. Um, first of all, I would like to thank our sponsors, which are New Relic and Develando. I would like very to hear very big applause for them because because of this because of them this event is possible today. So let's hear it. Why we are here today? We are here today to find out why monitoring of data is actually important for the businesses. What do we expect from that monitored data? What can we do with that data? Should we do it? Okay, when we do it, so what do we expect? What are the final definitions of that data? What are we, uh, what are we looking at? And all those questions and more we expect to hear answered by our first lecturer, who is, uh, whose name is Harry Kinko. Harry, please give it up for him. So, a few words about Harry. Harry has um, a working experience with the development background for more than 20 years. So, uh, he, he's been creating custom software solutions for customers around the globe. He has worked in cloud architecture and cloud migrations for many, many years. Sometimes his work feels more like software archaeology, especially when re-architecting legacy applications. Please, <laughs> give it up for him. All right, um, so welcome everyone. Um, pleasure to be here today, and um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I want to give you, firstly, I start the mic. And I hope you can hear me now better. Um, so firstly, um, you know, I want to give you some perspectives of um, how you can leverage monitoring data from your monitoring to make actually better business decisions, and how to get there um, from from just like looking at technical metrics, but also more um, on um, how you can you know define business metrics all of that. So like you said, I'm Harry. I work for New Relic, um, and um, been basically there for like the last two years and from a pre-sales perspective so I work, work a lot of with companies on the technical perspective you know getting things up and running evaluating things doing workshops and stuff like that so anyone watched the, um, the Super Bowl game on Sunday anyone yeah they, the right team won right so <laughs> um, so you know, imagine you know you sit there with your, with your friends you know watch the game and suddenly, like, the lights go out, right? So the game is gone for you. You know, um, of course, you're, you're sad and disappointed that you wanted to watch the game with your, with your friends, have beer and snacks and everything there. So, of course, you know, you're disappointed, all your friends are gone, and then you suddenly call your, um, you know, power grid provider, and they tell you, they, you know, why are you complaining, right? The, the, the service is, was um, available for 95% of the time, right? We don't we don't offer you 100 percent of the of the time that your service is available, right? So we need to think about why this is important to monitor all your um, environment and what to do when things go sideways. Services will fail, and they will fail always, right? There is no thing as you know, hey, I, I can um, rely on that my service is always available and, and visible. So what I would like to um, do is kind of like give you, um, you know, five different perspectives on how you can leverage um, the data from monitoring to make better business decisions, and basically also focus on trends and, and future aspects that you can um, derive um, out of that. Um, the first, um, the key is kind of like how can you improve the um, the problem occurrence in the first place, and how you can work on, you know, getting to the root cause analysis of why this is happening, right? So if you want to make your decisions, you need to know everything that is happening in your environment. Um, how do you do that? You know, basically you want to proactively assess um, all your environment. You want to know everything that is happening in the end-to-end -end, um, um, infrastructure. It could be services, it could be infrastructure, it could be dependent services that you're, you're monitoring. And you want to know how your, perform uh, your services are performing, right? You want to know uh, whether dependencies um, you have, you know, firstly, you know, know what these dependencies are and basically then know when these dependencies, your, your services are not available, right? As we've seen in the, um, the Super Bowl game, you know, you want to measure everything that is happening and want to um, make sure that your SLA is always um, there for you. Finally, you know, you don't want to pro um, actively you know, look at that data. You know, ideally, you want to get notified. You know, proactively get notifications when things go 
go sideways when things are not performing as, as expected. This is, you know, I have two examples from our own um, environment that I wanted to quickly share with you. So this is one of the services that we provide. Um, it's a, a, an account service. So basically our customers can go in there, look at their account data, and look at basically all the other accounts that they have access to. What happened is that, you know, there's some, you know, avatar on that page, you know, for the user, and it could give you a, a nice, nice image. And at some point, um, that avatar service that we depended on was a third-party service um, went down, right? So we um, um, developed that, that service back then in a way that, you know, once that, that dependent service is gone and it is not available anymore, our, completely side, our complete site crashed um, and it wasn't responsive anymore. So basically, just by looking at that single icon, it's really not an important thing on the, on the website or on the account page. But you know, cause the whole page to go to go down, which is really not um, ideal. Um, a second example is kind of like um, again the, the account service that we were looking at. The problem there was um, there was um, some user who was exiting that page. Like he he asked for you know give me hundred thousand accounts um, for um, for my data. And basically, the, the service, you know, it tried to do it, be responsive and kind of like work on all of this this data, get all the account data back. But at some point, it just crashed. It was too slow. The site went down. And so basically, that that request that was really um, not really reasonable to get like hundred thousand accounts, but it caused the, the whole service to go down and and crash the whole application. So basically, you know, it's important to know when things um, are not um, reporting and, and having performance problems. So you want to be aware of everything that is happening and, and um, work on, on these items. Second um, key from my perspective is kind of like you want to be aware of you know, every interaction that is happening. Not only from a technical perspective, but basically you want to know you know, when your users, how your users are behaving and want to proactively get um, um, alerted uh, before your users actually notice what, what is happening. Why is this important? Um, so basically, um, if you don't like see every interaction on your application, every interaction on your services, you might miss the important ones, right? If you do some some sampling, or you think, you know, hey, maybe if I look at 80% of the data, you know, I, I will probably be fine. But maybe in the rest of the 20% of the data, maybe that is something where where important information is missing. You want to, you know, know your users. It's kind of like a sensitive topic in uh, Germany. Um, what I mean with knowing your users is kind of like not knowing, you know, PII data, but knowing how your users are using your your services. You know, what type of device they use, when they use the service. Kind of like, you know, um, look at that type of data and know how their behavioral patterns um, look like. And again, you know, um, you want to set up checks. For all of these different types of information, so you can get alerted on when when your users hit certain limits, or when users are you know using maybe some features in your application that you um, want to be um, also um, notified if, if anything important happens in your in your services. What are the benefits? You know, basically, you know, once you do that and you know how your users are behaving, you know basically how, how your audience looks like. You know what what type of user, the personas, the 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 type of um, users, um, how they act with your application, and you can then use that information to predict behaviors for for future. And we'll see a couple of examples later today. What you can also do is kind of like generate trend reports um, and look at patterns on all these technical KPIs. So this is really just focusing on the technical KPIs, which will help you then to make um, you know, decision making basically in real time. So once you know how to um, um, you know, get the data and how to process the information, you can make predictions for, for future behavior. The third um, key is kind of like, you know, why should you monitor your environment? Well, one of the reasons to do that is also kind of like mitigate risk um, for your application. You know, basically, there's risk in all different kinds of services. Maybe there's risk that your host will go down, that the data will not respond. You know, all different kinds of risk that are involved and risk is basically a, a measure of likelihood of um, you know surprise occurring. You don't you want to basically remove the um, this this level of surprise. 
um, you know, keeping a system you know, available um, means to remove risk and you know, hence removing surprise in your, in your application. But you know, as you know, with nowadays, these systems get more dynamic, they scale up and down, and the bigger they get and the more services you have, the more complex it is to, to have um, kind of like visibility into all of this. So basically, you want to ideally work on risk um, management, um, and if this is kind of like in the heart of um, you know, providing these high available um, systems um, for your environment. So let's focus on the risk mitigation for a second. Um, basically, you, know, you want to know um, what to do when a problem occurs, right? So you want to um, reduce the impact that it has, and you want to also make sure that the um, application works as best as possible if anything happens. Um, and then, of course, more importantly, you need to have a plan in place if the, something happens, what do you do? How to, how to inform people, how do you, um, your, your support teams and your operation um, works and, and can remediate um, everything that is happening. Um, so that brings me to the fourth um, key um, for this, um, which is kind of like monitor availability and the, the response that you provide to your services. <coughs> what you want to do is kind of like understand how your applications and, and your services um, are performing. Um, you want to ideally use application monitoring to keep an eye on everything that has happened with the application, how it's performing, generate notifications and things like that. And ideally not you know, have that um, measured on, on hard facts, but basically having the baseline in place. So basically if you know how your application is performing over time, maybe you have some pattern that looks like on Monday to Friday you have like a certain load on your application and then it goes down on the weekend. This baseline is kind of like important for, for your applications if you want to know what is happening and also you know, predict behavior for, for future um, um, responses. So and then the responsiveness is kind of like, you know, if a problem occurs, you need to have a plan in place on how to fix that problem. Does, you know, anyone on your team know what to do? Do you have um, plans in place or playbooks? Basically what we always try to um, um, suggest is kind of like having a run book in place. If a certain error occurs, this is what the steps are required to do. This is what, um, how to, uh, what systems to, to look into, you know, what services to monitor and, and things like that. So everything um, is kind of like important, but you should be um, preparing this before anything happens, right? You need to have a well-established plan in place, you know, document the processes, you know, know whom to contact, um, maybe have um, other services in place um, that you can look into and have kind of like that, that, that chain of um, responsibility in there. Oops, sorry. Um, that also brings me to the last um, key for here, uh, for this topic is how can you um, make sure that not only the technical KPIs and, and measurements are in place, but also your key business um, KPIs, right? So this is important because you know typically all your services that you provide, all your applications, at some point they have a business reason, right? And ideally, um, what you need to do is kind of like have um, you know KPIs in place so that you know you know what to measure. What, and typically the hardest part is, you know, how do you define your, your, um, your KPIs? Um, you need to know where to get the data from, right? We can derive, you know, pretty, you know, a lot of data business KPIs from the technical information that we collect. But basically, maybe if this is not enough, you can customize that. Maybe you need to have additional data points, additional events that you need to capture. And then this will help you then to, um, you know, basically create these KPIs. Up. Um, by doing that, you know, you know, thinking outside of the box is always, you know, helpful. You know, don't, you know, have that, you know, silo focus on, you know, different services, but maybe have the whole um, interaction chain in, in, in mind um, to think of. And you know, the last one is, you know, don't get trapped into the tech jail. You know, basically, you know, meaning that, you know, yes, um, I guess we are all techies, right? We love technology and things like that. You do have to, you know, look at services and monitor things. But basically, you know, if you think outside of the box and think of like in the bigger picture, you, you can basically um, focus on the business um, that the, these applications and services are, are targeted for. Once you have, um, you know, defined your, your KPIs and your business metrics, um, you know, you don't want to, you know, 
create the, um, the metrics every time again and again. So basically having a standard set of dashboards in place to visualize the information automatically. Ideally in real time um, to have access to that, having a dashboard in place that has all the important metrics in there um, to, for you to look at. Um, what we also um, try to focus on is kind of like democratize that data. Data shouldn't be there just for one single person or for a single group. Ideally, everyone should have access to the same set of data and can, can work on that and create their own maybe custom dashboards. This is important that, you know, first of all, you know, that finger pointing is, is um, not happening, that one team says, hey, my data shows green, your data shows, um, you know, some red information. So basically having all um, um, people and, and um, um, responsible persons looking at the same set of data is kind of like key. And basically from there, you can you know, basically say trends and make real-time decisions on that um, data. This will also help you, you know, with some of the customers, they have kind of like these game days where you know, they look at data and compare teams with each other and things like that. So you can be creative in, in how to um, you know, leverage that data that you could, um, collected and visualize in, in such dashboards. And also finally, you know, you know, if you received um, you know, certain business KPIs and you measured those, you know, celebrating success is kind of like also um, important. Um, so, in in summary, this these are a couple of key things to look at when you try to um, you know use the data from the monitoring to you know build technical KPIs, build um, you know business KPIs. If you want to you know remove um, risk from your environment and surprises, this is kind of like some some key topics to focus on. The question now is, you know, where does this data um, come from? And um, I wanted to give you a quick um, overview at the end um, to show you, you know, what we try to get is in, and this is what I also mentioned earlier, we try to get like all of the data, right? Not like single interactions into silos, but basically focus on the whole um, journey and the, the chain that the typical user interaction go through. So that could be, you know, information that comes from devices, could be information also uh, that you use from, from you know, social media where you can do some um, sentiment analysis and have that reflected also into, um, um, into your environment and having performance benchmarks against um, those sentiments maybe, you know, having data from you know, the, the, the servers, the host, the databases, all these services will then have data into one um, um, bucket and then you can start um, doing some analysis, building the technical as well as the business API. <coughs> We'll see later on in, in the next talk um, some, some use cases and how um, um, Andre uses this type of data to actually do some analysis and work on some you know, AI patterns to actually analyze the data. But basically what I wanted to mention here is that you know, the type of data that he received from, from, um, from us as a, as a sample is kind of like not like all of this, the, the environment, all of the chain, but really just from a single um, um, environment. We were just looking at this kind of like device data and I think you'll be impressed in what he looked, um, what he achieved with just looking at the data without any further input from myself. So this was um, really interesting. And then finally um, I wanted to provide a kind of like a use case from a real um, um, scenario um, and this is one of the customers we have and um, you'll be surprised in what and what they um, kind of like achieve. And I wanted to give you just this perspective on what's possible. And it's not really only just you know, data that you can collect from you know, business applications or you know, technical environments like databases or stuff like that. So this is really just an example, and I'll start the, um, the video here. This is really just an interesting topic, um, if I can manage to start this. So this is a um, um, you know a retailer in the UK that actually uses um, 
you know, our data to collect all these data points from all these robots. So it's basically a huge warehouse without having a, a kind of like a retail store. What these, what these robots basically do is they put products that the users can buy online into these, these carts and they walk around and you know, do things, collect the data, put this in the basket and stuff like that. What is interesting about that is that the, the company leveraged um, the data that they collected to find out that you know, in some parts of that whole um, factory, basically, it wasn't just, it, it was just not used, right? So they had like a third of that, that factory not being used and you know, these robots couldn't, couldn't get to that point. And you know, with looking at the data, they found out about um, this issue and, and you know, solved it by you know, changing some configuration here and there. But basically, you know, having the visibility into the data and, and you know, doing something that is important for their business was key in, in solving that, that issue. And it basically saved them a couple, um, a good amount of money because that data warehouse in that region was just not um, you know, responding to, to requests. So really, um, and one of one example um, use case um, that, that I thought was, was interesting um, for this approach. So yeah, um, that was um, basically my talk. Um, thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Knowing when your applications get requests, whether they, when, whether they fail, do they have any dependent services, and things like that. So having all the data available, available for getting the information in the first place, and then monitoring, you know, in what um, um, type of um, environment was my data available, um, right? So looking at the SLAs, basically, the, the response is kind of like knowing what to do if um, errors occur, right? So if you have some, um, you know, like the example before where the, the avatar service um, failed, knowing that information and knowing what to do with the data is kind of like the responsiveness in having a plan in place and this is what you need to do, this is what you need to follow, this is a run book for this specific issue that you need to follow. So you simulate so you the report cases or something like that? You can do that and this is what typically customers do um, proactively, so they um, have proactive like monitors in place to check um, certain services. But you can also, um, you know, have these um, these playbooks in place for things that you know occur. If an if an you know application response isn't what you expect, you need to know you know whom to contact, who's responsible for certain services, and then going deeper into um, the the chain on how to make that root cause analysis. Okay. Does that we are all risk management, but it's fine. Okay. I understand. I understand the principle. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You mean like the question is related to can we correlate that information from the same user? Right. So you could basically, you know, out of the box. Um, at least the relic doesn't collect any personalized information. So you could, if you have the user ID, for instance, know that it's coming from a mobile device or it comes from, from a web application, right? Yes. But if you don't have this information, you can add maybe some technical, um, you know, user, um, not user IDs, but maybe some, some IDs that, re that, um, that allows you to make that con um, reference to the user itself, right? You could possibly use a hash on, on the, um, on the user ID to follow um, that information and know then um, that the user what came from a mobile device or came from a, from a web, web application. Does that? Right. So if you don't register it, basically we out of the box we don't have like any capability to correlate this information. But there are ways to enhance it. There's, there's APIs in place and how you 
can add additional information. And one of the things could be to have like a hash over the, the user ID to know and have that correlation point, if that makes sense. But out of the box, you know, um, you would have to have one um, correlation ID that, that, that you can leverage to get that, that connection right. Yeah, it's correct if I'm wrong, but I, I think I still want to remember when Simon used to write this news out that. Is that correct? With lean startups. Um, lean startups. Lean startups. Yeah. I mean, um, the history of Neuralink is basically um, coming from the startup environment, right? Um, and since a couple of years now, we, we focus on, on business, but yeah, it could be um, the case that this is um, where it's coming from. Yeah? Any other questions? Thanks, Gary. Thank you very much. Okay, 20, I think. Wow. Okay. And uh, he's a lead data scientist at Epica AI and a software engineer, entrepreneur, author, uh, AI and big data research team, and consults about AI adoption in digital marketing, also e commerce, and text processing, right? Yes. Perfect. Is it fine? Yeah. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you all here. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, making predictions over customer data. And the whole story about uh, this meetup was that uh, New Relic uh, gave us some small sample of information to see what we can extract from this information. It's all about customer data. And uh, so uh, I had on one, only one weekend to try to do something, so we didn't ingest this data uh, into our platform, Epica. And um, so I'm going to tell you how we process data in Epica, typically for customers. And then I'll show you how it is possible to analyze customer data, for instance, from your relic, to understand what kind of value it is possible to extract from there. So this is the first part. And then my colleague, Andres will uh, talk about uh, how about the use case, how we achieve like how we improve CTR for one of the big publishers in Spain, for instance, with this approach. Really. So that this might be interesting and relevant for uh, today's topic. And uh, so basically, this is the structure of my presentation. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about Ethica. Uh, I will give data science at Epica, and you can like check what we do and contact me anytime. Any questions regarding this? Uh, so this is the only marketing slide I have because uh, Devlando asked me to make a technical presentation. So believe me, customer data is important. I guess everybody knows, and this is a big deal. This is a billion-dollar market. There are a bunch of vendors. Everybody tries to improve conversion, like whatever possible ways. So uh, you have to take care about this today. Uh, first, everybody knows uh, the CRM approach. It's pretty straightforward. You have a customer profile, and you fill it with some data sequentially. Modern CRM have. Uh, automation tools to connect with some different sources and this profile could be filled automatically but uh, at the end of the day this is like step by step process but what happens now so we have a modern customer journey if somebody wants to buy something he may is like very complicated path through different websites he tries to explore ask research browse again and the whole idea is the following. What if we can collect customer profile from this complicated journey online on the website and complete the automatic? So how we can approach it? Of course, checking pixels. This is the well-known story. Google has it, like Facebook has it. Our tracking pixel was inspired by a segment. This is a customer data infrastructure. This is <coughs> themselves 
And basically, if you already know it and use it, we're probably going to talk because we can offer good integration. Yeah. But this is just the like the top of the iceberg, but in the bottom of the what we have. We need to make a cookie matching because we need to uh, collect this profile from different sessions, from different devices. We need to have certain precision on this process and we need to integrate third parties. For instance, we can match with DSP systems and uh, understand what is the ID of the customer. This might be the answer of those previous questions, how to, how to match users. We need to filter uh, bots because there are a lot of bots, everybody knows it, and we need to remove search engines from customer profiles, <laughs> some synthetic requests, some parsers. And basically, we need to build a reliable architecture, which is today called like Lambda architecture, with streaming, batching, low latency, full tolerance, so with seamless integration, deployment, the whole product should be totally reliable. And this is the big issue. You can imagine how it might be like, complicated technically. I may proudly say that we received successfully 40 terabytes of data only in January 2K19. So, that's not. So, this is one of our things. Uh, and uh, this, this is how we call it like um, event sourcing. Well known pattern in the big data technology. Another step of this process is to material, materialize these events into a, something which we call basic profile. So we have all those events, 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 they have different structures, they have a lot of metadata, devices, browsers, uh, user data. And basically, we process these in order to store, first, we store our uh, material basic profile in the relational database. We still use PostGrid, but now we're switching into graph database because uh, it's really crucial to match those profiles fast and uh, reliably. So this is what we use for this purpose if you are from the data world, I guess you know this kind of And then you may say, let's predict something. But not yet. So first we need to enrich those profiles. Basically, this is one of the popular requests beside like predicting some conversion or whatever, is just to make an enrichment because obviously we have a limited um, we have limited information coming from uh, events and uh, some fields might be missing, but we want to know this information about all customers that we have, it is possible. So there are a couple of uh, things we can do. We can integrate with CRMs, because obviously this is like the root approach and they have a lot of data about it. We can ingest uh, well-known CSV and uh, Excel files to make. Also we have a partnership with Oracle Data Cloud, which was a real guy before. And basically, we can integrate with Bukai, and Bukai could provide additional information which we don't know about our customers, but they know. From different sources, they have a, a lot of information. We can even <coughs> go there and uh, ask what do they know about you. Like a simple test from cookies, from your activities somewhere. And basically, so after augmenting, and we use prediction definitely to, if we have partial information, we could try to fill the whole data with this information. It shouldn't be really precise as you expect. It's enough to just to remove uh, unknown data to make second part of this process more uh, accurate. But anyway, this is important just for, like, for itself. Knowing more information about customers is better than not. not. Um, and we come to the like core scene of our platform. This is Cluster Builder. Uh, we divide our, I mean, what's the debate? The so we got this big amount of customers. How are we going to treat them? The core concept is Cluster. So we take groups of customers to satisfy some Target. 
we may do it descriptively. Like we may check uh, some topic viewers. For instance, by URLs, we can extract information from URL and make a decision that they like browse some general information. By some actions like these specific actions or subscribe something. And uh, finally, we can predict potential new buyers, which haven't done yet any of those actions. And or content viewers, for instance, and those clusters we can use to get better conversion. And this is very important. We can process anonymous data. So imagine you have to identify, you have to, like, in your CRM system, you have to know phone, email, uh, I don't know, name, last name. But here, we can just use a hash. And that's all. So we collect information over this hash. And we can work with this information to, to, get, to get, like, better profile. We can build a customer journey. And we can predict for this hash something and show him something that he might be interested in, he or she, <laughs> and, uh, and, and use this without like violating any of those GDPR and all this stuff. So yeah. I, I think this is really, this is really crucial in, in this case. So predictions. Yes, you can make predictions. If you are from this data science world and you a cluster, you might instantly imagine that we do some unsupervised prediction. <coughs> yes, we do, but it's like limited. The only story that we have for this unsupervised prediction is to split big clusters uh, for some reason. I mean, if you want, you don't have the whole budget to cover all those people, or you want just like operate less clusters at the end. So unsupervised. Unsupervised machine learning we use only for um, for limited number of cases just to split big clusters into a small one. What is really important is that next what we are trying to predict is who is going to make an action in the future to the conversion. So we use decision trees here extensively and uh, this would be a part of my example of processing new relic data, so I don't want to stop on this really now. But uh, if you're from business world, just let me explain a bit that uh, decision trees really <laughs> this makes decision. They split like the whole data set into smaller chunks based on your features like on gender or on some other class and uh, based on some metrics this is the first process just splitting, 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 splitting uh, there are <coughs> several metrics to, to control the quality of those trees and then those trees are pruned to make a decision like what is it possible for instance to make a decision in this uh, node or in the other node these decision trees, I will show it later, gives very like good opportunity to have decision interpretation. So you always know what was the reason of um, splitting those data. And you also can use this information to, um, to build a cluster over it because the whole those trees are accessible. Typically methods using decision trees are quite complicated. They use a lot of parameters so you can control all those processes specifically. Uh, that is why it's tricky to, to use. But finally, this is not a this is not something which is called cargo competition. You don't need to to find very precise or very very good accuracy here in the marketing world because you need to Keep in mind the balance. If your clusters would be super precise for clickers, for instance, it would be hard to run marketing campaigns over those clusters because they are too small. I mean, people from marketing world, they need to kind of, they need to use clusters big enough to cover many people day by day, rather than wait someone who is highly to convert them the whole week. That's the challenge. But I will stop uh, about this problem a bit later. Uh, then we try to predict when. 
So mathematically, this is less complicated problem. So you just need to to get a histogram and uh, just determine, for instance, some hour with bigger activity, or you need to do some smoothing with this kernel density estimation to determine the right uh, time interval for uh, making action. That's the challenge, but it's not as easy. And the second part, we are trying to predict what customer is going to buy. This is totally different story. So I just like to mention that we have a recommender system for this purpose. We vectorize profiles, vectorize items, and do regression over these vectors. This is like a renting problem. And uh, you know, uh, I can speak out about those recommender systems because we get a lot of uh, like experience with them. This is not uh, only a challenge to make it working good, but you need to deliver it again in the big data infrastructure <laughs> with all this low latency and all that stuff. So this is the whole story. I hope if the line will, will ask me to make another speech, I can talk about recommended engines, but this is not uh, a topic for today's uh, presentation. And, uh, and finally, Activation. So you have clusters, what's the value? We need to activate them. What kind of activation are we offering? It's typical like um, advertising platforms, Google Analytics, Facebook. We use website widgets. This is like very, I think it's a strong point from our side because you can integrate recommended widgets on website. And all content widgets on your website trying to, uh, how to say, follow the customer to the right decision. Then um, you can send data to demand side platforms, CRNs, ERPs, call centers, whatever we can, we have, or we can build an integration tool. And basically just increase efficiency and achieve business efficiency. Sometimes it may not work. That's true. We can't guarantee like magic. But what we can say for sure is that uh, those predictive clusters which were built to target conversions typically performs better, sometimes like two <coughs> times better than uh, clusters without this uh, special setup. So this is summary. We do data capture from different sources. We do uh, descriptive customer journeys in clusters. This is the key point. And uh, future behavior action. <coughs> and we activate. And from this activation, so imagine that we need to start today processing your data, just like we tried this new area. And you did an export, and we ingest this export into our system, and like start operating today. But after that, our pixel checks the conversion information like we wanted to see at the end. And we can use this feedback information to make our models better at the end in, the, in our infrastructure. Basically, what pixel gives us in general, we, know, we exactly know the format of data that we are trying to get. Imagine that if you try this for my consultancy past, you come to another company and you get one data structure. You come to another company and you get another data structure. And this is hard to, to put like everything in some uh, say, automated process. You need to treat each data set separately. But here with Pixel, we can like, we know what we expect. And we process this instantly and uh, get results. So uh, we already work with all of those companies, and uh, like so, we use this new level. How to say? Um, we use this new phrase as a reference. So we just who is going to be our next client? We try to predict for them, or what your client is going to do like next week, next month. Typically, it's like the but the forecast is not really reliable, but it's not 
Uh, this is what I want to say about our lab. So let me show is about processing unit. It was interesting experience. <coughs> Maybe some questions on this part. Yes? I've seen a one-up presentation um, on retail, of course. On, uh, so they use Bayesian network mm -hmm. for causality and uh, predicting mm -hmm. the mind and mind patterns. So what do you think about that? And the next thing is, um, are you taking advantage of, uh, for example, Azure uh, cognitive services or other um, mm -hmm. available services like available from AWS or Google? And right instead of mm -hmm. developing our own network. So you know there are a lot of a lot of companies which tries to uh, to to utilize different machine learning approaches to this problem. I mean, uh, I'm what I'm trying to say is that we consider, uh, for instance, uh, decision trees like we just like. I mean, that's the point. If another company understands better Bayesian networks, they may use Bayesian networks. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that decision trees are a bit more complicated. There are a lot of parameters and you may play with it. And you have this kind of interpretability that I will show a bit later. Maybe you consider this as an advantage. But I also know that some companies does uh, like recommendations with reinforcement learning, which is really like crazy. I can't imagine how they operate it. But whatever, if they see uh, value for this. Yeah. I wouldn't use, for instance, some real networks here because uh, this is a bit different problem. And typically, in classification problem, trees are bad, as I know. But whatever, if any other company had better experience with this, yes. So it's not a point of, you know, it's not a point of, as I told before, this is not a kind of competition. You need to achieve business goals. And the trick is that uh, the <laughs> final metric is not exactly like accuracy or F1 or something like this. It's another. And sometimes you don't need accurate solution finally because you may break the delivery with accurate solution having such a small cluster. We replaced this kind of form. So it's, it's tricky from a business perspective. We, what we actually try to deliver, of course we mentioned this kind of prediction because it's cool, but we try to deliver conversion. We don't try to do a decision tree. We just consider that it helps to achieve conversion value. But another company definitely would say that they are approaching to the decision. So, there's no problem. Uh, Sorry, uh, may I ask? One more question. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah, so uh, actually for me it's a little more fun <coughs> to be able to use profiles from different systems. Uh, it depends on systems. So, uh, can you give me an example? No, 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 no you, you mentioned that you can just uh, profile information from Salesforce, <coughs> and uh, I don't know from particular system and some part of the Yes, we need, we need, you know, we need, um, how to say, we need to have an agreement, technical agreement, so that we can match IDs. So we need to be able to uh, uh, like to exchange this information, to have a callback with our ID with another system. For instance, with this, this system, this is not this is not magic. Of course, technically, this is always like ID matching and uh, having an agreement how to do it right. The test actually, there are a lot of issues. Even third-party systems could have like issues with their matching and we try to face it and check it and we actually try to be precise about this we <coughs> do different kind of tests for uh, for guarantee that our matching is uh, actually works and works right mm -hmm. and it is suitable for like a long customer job mm -hmm. but at the end this is the the um, how to say this is the process of the right integration just like you use external API, sometimes they are not public, you need to have a deal. There's like a combination of uh, like management process and technical. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I want to complement something on on them. As you, as Andre explained, uh, on the on the top, tip of the ivories are, are, are pixels that captures mostly uh, first party data. Mm -hmm. Even though you know, think of a digital asset as a website, and, and mostly of your visitors could be anonymous, right? So people go to the website but actually do not convert, do not sign up, or just go check. And another part of of, of, of these digital asset users could be known or identified users. Now, uh, we see uh, there's a tremendous opportunity on the first party data, because it's actually the, the richest data there is, uh, but it's still anonymous. You understand what I mean? It's still, it's still you, you don't know much about that person yet. Uh, regarding what you said uh, of how, you know, a person could access this website via mobile, via desktop, via an iPad. So you have three different identities, right? There's something called identity resolution that your ECAP solves the identity resolution issue with a prediction. What we do is we try to predict using algorithms and, and, and analysis of variables that these ID, ID, these three IDs belong to the same user with a 75% accuracy level, and we predict that this is the same. So now we have not so many three IDs, but one, let's say, anonymous <coughs> person. And we track its customer journey and the other option is to bring third-party data, anonymous, anonymous third-party data provided to Oracle Data Cloud by many uh, data providers. And there's a process where we try to do something that is called data enrichment. Try to see if this anonymous user is man, woman, age, uh, uh, income level, uh, um, brands uh, that they're interested in. So you start building like still anonymous uh, profiles of anonymous. But that this helps you to, to improve your communications and marketing activities. So I hope that I clarified a little bit of your question. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So it's personal idea, but it's more fancy to start. So the whole story was that um, to get some data from your Eric, and we uh, we talked with Harry, and Harry, uh, like, look, this is the data. I can send you from a, from a training platform, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not a real data. I mean, yeah, it's, from it's, it's yeah, simulated data. Yeah, it's simulated data from the environment. We tried to make it export, and I had a weekend to process it. Like, this is why I decided to do it technically. But this technical approach shows you how do we do this inside our platform. Of course, it doesn't cover all secrets, but I can explain some typical Things that you are able to, to do with data, or that you are going to get if you are like, going to work with that. So um, I'm just to make it fair. I will execute every piece of code here. So here is the data. I just collect several export from my folder, and here is what we have. Like typically, we have missing data, and some uh, columns. I don't know what it's all what the all about. And just like what the first thing I can notice, this is a timestamp data. And of course, I'm curious to split it into different features. Um, because you can take into account seasonality, periodicity, or whatever. And uh, this is the simple way of treating it. Uh, there are some tricks tips and tricks to, to make better predictions over this um, timestamp data, but let's uh, check what we have here in terms of timestamps and what is not actually constant. So basically what makes sense. And it appears to be that all of this data from the same day and uh, like only hour is different. So okay, <laughs> let's proceed, but this timestamp is not going to give us some um, good insights. So finally we have uh, 4,000 rows and 48 columns. What are they? Uh, so basically, I just like, okay, so we have item, we have some card information, we have like a lot of delays, durations. I know this is a typical point about New Relic that they check these durations, and this is really important. I will show you why. So um, after that, I don't know anything about this, I need to check uh, 
I need to check both. Here, uh, lately, when I tried to build first models, I noticed that there are strong, like, that uh, when I try to remove basic URL of action, because we will extract, like, the type of action from URL, I also saw that other URLs affects very, very strong in the model results. And I like, saw that there are other types of URLs which I need to remove from model in order to be fair at the end. So they are kind of technical, and we also don't need them. I just mentioned them like, to, to keep the story complete. And of course, I'm going to manage and name missing values. But this is not mandatory for uh, modeling. So you asked about uh, these cognitive services. We don't use uh, cloud-based machine learning services. We use H2O. You know, this is famous framework for machine learning. And uh, we like it a lot because of scalability. It's written on Java. It's fast. It's like there are a lot of things we need about H2O. And the issuer can manage NAs automatically, <coughs> but in order to check correlations and to have more consistent picture, I'm just taking care about them now, now. But this is easy, so I just determine which columns have missing values. I just fill those missing values depending on the type. So uh, numbers are zeros, and uh, um, objects are unknown. This is where I do this. And, uh, so let's just check that we don't have these events up in there. And uh, let's check that, like, for instance, item edit column is treated as expected. Then, of course, we are not interested in constant columns, but again, so h can remove constant columns automatically. But here, if I want to find correlations, I probably <coughs> don't need them. Vienna. So the rest is the problem. Um, now let's put some target events. So I noticed at New Relic dashboard that all target events are calculated using URL. So if we visit the columns, for instance, we have a browser. Event. If we visit the shopping cart, this is like shopping cart event. Or if a manage count, then we bought something. And actually, the same approach we have in Netica, we process a lot of URLs to understand better what happened with user on the left side. So I just create like two browse, new feature to browse, to, um, to see how it affects on the final conversion to card and to check card. To separate them. Let's check correlation. Correlation table. So we have high correlation between like potential and purchased columns. And actually, I was specifically interested in target variables. And uh, obviously, if you check out target variable, it's highly correlated with purchased information. Uh, definitely, if I want to predict checkout query, <laughs> I need to remove uh, all this purchased information. Others are more or less fine. So as I mentioned, like I remove the source of conversion from, and let's start modeling. So I mentioned H2O. You can notice that it is possible to manage number of threads. It means to specify how many cores do I need to utilize to process this data. And uh, I can, for instance, limit memory. So it's very, I have very good control in cluster what what amount of resources I want to dedicate to this uh, to the uh, to the model, and let's so I'm not going to start it again. Uh, yes, it started. So what I do, I put this information into H2 because it's like a, it's a clustering solution. Uh, all data is transferred through internal protocols, <coughs> and uh, I have to put my data frame into H2O to process it inside H2O. Uh, and then I check if I'm actually uh, like 
doing classification program. Uh, for instance, with two cards, because if it's, a, <coughs> if it's treated as enum, then I'm doing a classification program. If it's number, then H2O will consider this as a regression. So let's prepare our experiment. Let's uh, make two cards as a dependent variable, and uh, let's remove something which can affect this uh, two card information. So I'm removing two check cards, I'm keeping two graphs, and I'm removing like purchase form. So but I'm leaving this interesting potential card uh, total cost. Let's build a model. So there are not a lot of parameters here. Like I'm doing uh, cross validation because I don't have a lot of uh, information <coughs> to do a good uh, Validation split separately, so let's keep it for cross validation and see how it goes. And basically, uh, I will talk a bit more then about balance classes, so let's run it. It's pretty fast, even on my laptop. So I can it and what is particularly important? So, uh, we can check how training performed performed the idea but let's uh, take a look at this uh, cross validation data so what we interested in is actually in this whole this is amount of cases when we predicted true the customer is going to go to a car and look we have and this is what it should be actually can we explain to which industries is this applicable it's uh, for any industry which tries to do classification. So this is a typical binary classification, and we try to uh, understand whether you, for instance, uh, work in demand or not, whether you man or woman or. Okay. So um, basically, what we can see this is uh, this is called confusion matrix, and we can like understand our errors the quality of prediction, and uh, we see that we should predict false, but we predicted true over eight records, and we predicted true over this number of records. So, the error is actually quite low, but um, we need to keep in mind that sometimes we have a, um, like a balanced problem. So, imagine that we have only, as I remember, 100 and something, two card events inside this day. And basically, all other amount of events are not going to occur. And we basically can build a simple model which says it's not going to occur. And this model would be accurate, very accurate, because like the amount of actually variable uh, actions is very, very, uh, what do you say, very small comparing to the uh, amount of available actions. And we need to treat it right. We need to randomly select an I mean, reasonable amount of uh, not valuable action to put them together with valuable action. Otherwise, like model would be would have a lot of noise and is not going to treat problem right. Sometimes it the problem sometimes is not but we can derive, for instance, this simple parameter. We don't need in this H2O. We don't need to care specifically about the rate of those classes. We can just take balanced classes. Should I ask a question? Of course. Yeah, if you scroll, uh, could scroll up to the numbers, you should show me the other one. The other one. Uh, the other one. Oh, that one's right, yeah. You know, a little bit more. Okay. Here we are, the table. Mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Wait, when I see on the fourth tree, you yeah, know, mm -hmm. the fourth line, yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see the percentage of uh, wrong alerts, which means true, is is uh, uh, only uh, 0.2 uh, yeah, yeah, percent. The right. other is three percent. So we have a we have a factor of ten between the quality of the prediction. Maybe it's a number of things. But is is it true that do I understand right that the prediction of true is by factor ten less good as the prediction of false? 
Is that what it with the mercy? Uh, yes, yes. Is that, is that and and what? Why is that? Or what is the consequence of such an insight? That you if you if you make a model and see okay, okay if they are these this is the quality of the model. Mm -hmm. What is the consequence for your work, or, or how you you assess the predictions? Uh, uh, down. Oh, not down as well. Yeah. Do you know a little bit more? Okay. Here we are. That table. Oh, yeah. when, when I see on the fourth tree, yeah, mm -hmm. on the fourth line here, yeah, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see the percentage of uh, wrong alerts, which means true, is, is uh, uh, only uh, 0.2%. Uh, yeah, yeah, the the other is 3%, so we have a we have an factor of 10 between the quality of the prediction. Maybe it's a number of things. But is, is it true that, do I understand right, that the prediction of true is by a factor of 10 less good as the prediction of false? Is that on the uh, Yes, right? yes. Is that, is and and what? Why is that? Or what is the consequence of such an insight? That you, if you, if you make a model and see, okay, okay if they are these, this is the quality of the model. Mm -hmm. What is the consequence for your work, or, or how you you assess the predictions? Uh, I, if we have this error, this is kind of three percent of error. Yeah, but that is still, for me that is blurring. Because uh, if you would mm -hmm. extend the true to the same number, just extra extrapolating no. the, 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 the error. No, no, it's not. Uh, I mean, it's not so, same. okay, uh, if we want to to make it, for instance, less, we just, we just, we consider this separately. Yeah. But for, and, how do I say, for a customer, we just deliver average. Sometimes you can't explain all the details, you know, if you want to, this perform like, Worse than this, like <coughs> he don't do it. He just okay. We are ninety percent accurate in average. Mm -hmm. So that's the point. All right. Okay. But okay. We yes. This is, uh, this, is, the, the, the this is this is this is important. Okay. Let's but see. The, the, okay. Obviously, the quality yeah, 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 of the two is different. Yes. So yes. You get an average. Nice. So mm -hmm. this is the look. type of average. Uh, look. Look, look for a magic. Let's remove this, let's move okay. the classes and see how it goes. Okay. Yeah, let's remove it. Okay. So now it's different. Okay, yeah, right, we understand. So yeah. it's even worse now. The error of true is by 28% and the error of false is by oh oh it's so even less ten now we have three more than two a uh, factor of ten power of two. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Is that so what, why is that the case? Why is true? Is no, it I'm just, the, the number this is, you're, you're, like, you're talking about a separate problem about like um, mm -hmm. targeting some uh, some specific case, you know? But what I'm trying to say at the end with our marketing case, yeah. you know, we are interested about this yeah. and which is this in total. We might be interested to reduce this. We are not actually, so it's more or less fine. Even if it's like, I don't know, 50%, we are more or less fine. Okay. Because, um, you know, we build, if you're trying to predict people who is going to convert, yeah. you definitely get like small number of people because of, yeah. data, because of historical data and because of, you know, limitations. What I going to do next? So if you have, for instance, one, only 1,000 people, mm -hmm. and you're going to run marketing campaign, and yeah. Facebook says you, no, no, 1,000 is it's nothing. I can't play this type of like, audience. Okay. What we <coughs> need to do look alike. And this like smooths all the precision okay. into... So we, yeah, yeah, we have okay. our like secret <laughs> magics to, to balance this, to make it both like wider and reach some, some like reasonable uh, accuracy here. Let's change it. But from the 136 true yeah. uh, correlations, 28% may be wrong. Yes. So yes. What? <laughs> okay, so more <laughs> Okay, okay nice. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good that you're asking. Mm -hmm. No, actually, only three are wrong. 136 is fine, it's for different. <coughs> the figures on the main diagonal is correct prediction. Yes, so this is this is when we are right. Eight thousand eight hundred six. This is when we are right. This and this and this is when we are wrong. Exactly. What what I see is that on the true line, mm -hmm. you see that the, the deviation of yeah. the objective is is significant. 
compared to the false. And, and the question is why is also, it's also related to the size of the class. This is true. If you have uh, yeah, <coughs> that could be so the extrapolation of the class with one hundred bits to the other class maybe is wrong. But it is at least it is uh, significantly you measure that. Okay, maybe yeah, but that's it's exactly wrongly weighted. Of what you do with balanced classes. <laughs> so basically for the prediction model you take around the same amount of targets which are true and which are false. So that the target the targets are balanced. And then the result is much better because you then have ninety nine percent of cases which right. are anyway wrong. Yeah, right. Let's continue yeah, I, I see that. after the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. So basically, and this is interpretability. So this is this. Is, I just take one root decision tree to see how it performs. And look, I see that like potential car grand total is so important. It could split like true or false, very good. And then I write to Harry like Harry, what is potential car grand total? I don't know. <laughs> Remember, I like I did. I had no information about like the whole data and. Harry told me that this is like a historical amount in your card, and this is really important. I mean, you can just, in this case, having only a cluster, for instance, you can build a cluster. Like a uh, small amount in the card and big amount in the card. <coughs> and uh, run a campaign. And after that, for instance, we move to this username node, and we can also split usernames, like those who are going to convert here, and those who are not going to convert at the end and use it as a cluster. And of course, uh, like there are a lot of uh, delays and loading information here, and this page render duration is also important. So you like go and check it at the end if you want to do it. I can say this for sure. So we can analyze this. Naturally we have, like let's take a look at the average variable importance of all the trees. So here it is, so what we have. So we have this page rendering. Uh, page rendering duration. Yeah, so here it is. We have potential grant total, very important, <coughs> a lot of durations, and username, and session. So this, like, it's a good catch with this potential grant total. And uh, I said, how are you? I think we're going to. Like make it in our system because it's interesting uh, information that we also uh, need to manage. So, no, but at the end, I realized that we are quite close to the already. <coughs> and uh, with this information, with this pixel, and uh, basically there are a lot of like, opportunities. For so even having, if you have new ready, it is possible to make these kind of predictions. I spent only a week on and uh, so this is how I can extract information from this node, these users. For instance, for I just extract information about users who are going to come there. Of course, this is like 10 examples, and I write all the main. And uh, let's do a checkout model. Uh, just curious, and uh, basically I just remove this potential information because it's so important, and I'm curious how it goes further with this, without this potential information. If we can make it, like, let's do this, and um, let's turn it on. This time, balance classes are switched off, and basically, from the limits. Much worse, mm -hmm. right? Maybe. But look, the total cluster of our, like, probable conversion is bigger. Actually, at the end of the day, because where everything is like probability or whatever, but at the end of the day, we may get better results here because of the size of the cluster and the amount of users that we are able to capture with like partial attributes, not exact for uh, for those who are going to convert, but with partial attributes. And here, result might be better. We need to like take it into account. And let's like experiment again. So we have like nine, five, nine here. Let's try to balance classes. And uh, <coughs> I mean, worse in this case. 
things, but we, we try to, to make it better, but for us it's worse at the end. So you never know. Actually, we, we did kind of automation. We want to try different parameters to understand that like, things go in the right direction. Here is the tree here. So look, we have a lot of sessions. We have a lot of sessions. And we have a lot of durations. So now durations are important. So basically, I think that those sessions are somehow connected with durations. That is why it like splits uh, these type. But also from those sessions, we can extract information about users and your clusters. So without having historical information, duration is important. So I don't know how this synthetic data replicates the uh, the real life scenario, but I know New Relic is good about measuring those delays and durations. <laughs> because just because of that, uh, like your conversion obviously can go up or down. And basically that is uh, what I'm going to do is just to shut down our cluster. <coughs> so that's all from my side. Uh, next address and then I think we So uh, well this case study is gonna take ten minutes, uh, twelve at the most. Basically what we wanna show here it's an application to an actual customer and uh, how our data science team developed a, a, a prediction model for, uh, for a specific customer. Ah. Um, ready? Yeah. Did you switch? It should be ready, yes. So, yeah. yeah, it's on. Okay. So, uh, thank you, uh, New Relic, New Orlando, for having us here today. Uh, I'm Andres Soler, and um, I'm in charge of business development for uh, Epica. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, basically, I want to present a, a case study of uh, a publisher, uh, a big media company based uh, in Spain. Basically, they have interests in newspapers, magazines, like the typical uh, media company that's struggling uh, into the new digital world with fierce competitors like Google and Facebook and, and uh, trying to find new revenue streams and, and ways to to monetize their huge audiences because at the end of the day uh, uh, media companies uh, in any market of the world have uh, really big audiences still getting information uh, news, uh, sports information etc. So this is like the background of, of uh, what Grupo Godot has in Spain you can see their, their traffic is, is interested, monthly traffic for, for these sites. And um, uh, they, they approach us with a, with a problem. And, and uh, what we like to do as a startup, which is very flexible, is to, to approach customers uh, under a proof of concept uh, 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 engagement. And basically, uh, they're receiving for, a, for an advertiser, very well, well known here in Munich, BMW. Um, and as I'm look, I'm, I'm paying on a pay-per-click basis to Google and Facebook. You're charging me uh, on a CPM cost per cost per mille, cost per, per thousand impressions, and I need to improve my click-through rates. Uh, so here, the conversion. This is a publishing. The conversion was the click, right? What they what their advertiser or their client was trying to tell them is, I need, I need more clicks per one thousand impressions. What are you, please deliver. Okay, so basically we have this hypothesis that basically, basically we were able uh, to create, uh, based on the data, uh, to create, create clusters of what we call clickers uh, and expose this cluster of clickers to the same advertising campaign uh, of a control group. They usually, uh, as you may know, they usually uh, segment their campaigns uh, on a contextual on a contextual segmentation basis. They say, okay, one million impressions of BMW. Okay, what's the target? Uh, and okay, put 
half of those impressions on lavanguardia.com, the new site, on the economic section, and the other half uh, of the million impressions put it on mundodeportivo.com, on the football or soccer <coughs> uh, uh, section. Okay, and they get their typical CTRs, CTRs, 0 0.15, 0 0.19. And on the other hand, we built uh, a predictive model to be, and we call it cl a cluster of clickers, and we expose the same campaign, the same creativity, uh, the same amount of impressions, right, uh, to be able to compare. So, um, very important thing, we had to do an integration. They use the technology they use to deliver their advertising campaigns, it's, it's called, it's an ad server, a double click for publishers, now called uh, Google Ad Manager. And um, our data science team created a, a prediction model, uh, basically using the binary classification. I mean, we, we can event data, events like impressions and clicks, right? And, and we correlate it with event met metadata, such as device, operating system, uh, location of a, of, 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 a, of a visitor. Uh, and by, uh, by analyzing patterns and also building a, a binary classification model, we were able to build, and with a very interesting audience, we were able to build on these dates a cluster of 7 million potential clickers, right? And this is the cluster that was exposed to the exactly same campaign uh, that, as they usually do, with the, the regular way of segmenting the campaign, okay? So these were the results. Um, the proof of concept, it lasted three months. Basically, that's something very interesting that, that we're also uh, trying to, to explain it. Sometimes customers want to have immediate results and we say, no, we need at least a commitment to have a three-month period because we had to do some integrations with, uh, with their ad server. And after that, we had to do iterations. At the end of the day, on the first iteration, we didn't win over the, the control group. <laughs> but on the third one, our CTR was 83% above uh, their average CTR. So, uh, uh, by using Epica, Epica, there's, maybe not this time, but there's, uh, okay, I move here, and Epica at the end of the day is a, it's a software as a service platform. We provide access to, to, to our customers, to our partners, uh, where we are able to see the data platform, we are able to see the, the clusters, you are able to see our, our, our cluster builder at the end of the day. What we're trying to do is, to, to, to provide the possibility to, 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 to create clusters on your own. And what's more important here is, because at the end of the day, a cluster, it could be an amazing cluster, but if you don't activate the cluster, you're doing anything, right? So the key here is activate the predicted cluster. These guys were acti activating it via a, a, an ad server, which is the tool in which they monetize their audiences, but you could activate clusters via Digital advertising, Google, Facebook, programmatic buying, personalization of your website, email marketing mm -hmm. campaigns. So this is like the, the key point of, of that. Um, just to finish and wrap it up, this is basically what <coughs> Epica, a summary of what you've seen today, uh, 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 what Epica uh, does. And um, basically, mm, we try to, based on um, data, we add, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms to be able to make accurate predictions. And um, what's different uh, about our platform, if you're familiar, sometimes people say, hey, you're a, you a DMP, a data management platform. We do the same, what a DMP is capable of doing, yes, we, but we're not a DMP. Ah, then you're a CDP because you're able to ingest offline data, CRM data, point of sale data, and also digital data. Okay, we have a CDP capability. But even though we have those capabilities, we're not a DMP nor a CDP. We are a predictions platform, uh, and, and with with these uh, differentiators and uh, the possibility to bring uh, third-party data also. And um, and what well, this is this is I think this is this is uh, the the case study we wanted to present. And uh, thank you very much. Now we're gonna stay here for a while. If you have uh, technical and data science uh, questions you can discuss with Andre. If you, more well, marketing. You know, uh, platform presentations. So you can oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, if 
uh, anyone wants to see the, the, the platform uh, uh, in, in the real world or operating, we can set up a, a presentation or a, or a call or whatever. So thank you very much for having us here today. Thank you for coming. And, uh, and great to have you. Thank you, Andres.